Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've entered into the uh, last uh, third portion, the final 10 days of the month of Ramadan. These are some of the holiest days of the year. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran takes an oath by these 10 days, by these 10 nights. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by something, an oath is called a qasam, then that thing is truly great. That thing has takrim and it has tashrif, it has honor and it has majesty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, he says, wala asr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the asr. So asr is something great. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa duha wa layli idha saja. He takes an oath by duha in the layl. These things are great. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa tinu wa zaytun wa tuli sinin. By the fig and the olive and by Mount Sinai, and by the city of security, meaning Mecca to Al-Mukarrama. So these are things that are great. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La amruka, directly to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, by your life, and Ibn Abbas said, I don't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking an oath by someone else's life other than the life of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wal fajr, wa layali na'ashur. He says, by the Fajr and by the ten nights. And there's some difference of opinion here from the exegetes. Some of the ulama say these ten days or nights refer to the first ten days of Dhul Hijjah. Others say that these ten days and nights refer to the first ten days of Muharram, culminating in the tenth of Muharram, which is Yomi Ashura. <clears throat> Others say that these ten nights are the final ten nights of the month of Ramadan. In a hadith we quoted a few nights ago before the Tarawih. In uh, Sahih Muslim, our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says about the Prophet وسلم, during the final 10 nights of Ramadan, she says, Shadda mi'zarahu, that he used to uh, tighten his belt or tie his loincloth, wa ahya laylahu, wa aqaba ahlahu. Shadda mi'zarahu, he used to tighten his belt. The ulama say that this is an idiomatic expression, uh, meaning, Something like he used to prepare for serious work. Like what we say in English now, we say to roll up one's sleeves, to get ready for serious work, some serious business. And he would spend his night to get in the masjid. And he would engage in salawat, in prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and in tadabbur of the Quran. He would he would contemplate the meanings of the Quran. And Jibreel alayhi salam would descend upon him during these last 10 nights and they would uh, present Quran to each other in a process known as Mu'arama. And this was uh, witnessed by countless Sahaba. So he would step up his ibadah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during this time. Now Imam al-Razi, he says, defining Islam, he says, Al-Islamu, he said, Al-Islamu al-ibadatu lil-khaliq wa rahmatun lil-khaliq. He said, Islam is worship of the Creator while showing compassion and mercy to his creation. So the Sahaba described the Prophet ﷺ as Ajwadun Nas, that he was the most generous of all of humanity. But the similitude of his jud, of his generosity during the month of Ramadan, the similitude of his jud was like that of rain-laden clouds that bless the earth. Not only did he step up his ibadah during this month and approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but he would, uh, he would step up his compassion towards the creation. Last night we heard in the Tarawih from Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hasana. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says laqad, it is tantamount to an oath that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking an oath that indeed, indeed, I swear, laqad kana lakum fi rasulillah. And kana in Arabic is a verb that means to be. Kana usually means he was. But in the context of the Quran, it denotes dawam al istimrar. It denotes perpetuity and continuance. That indeed, I swear, you have in the Messenger of God, and will always have in the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uswatun hasana. A beautiful pattern of conduct. Liman kana yarju Allah wa yawm al akhir wa zakar Allah kathira. For anyone who has hope, raja, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and makes frequent and believes in the last day, has hope in the last day and makes zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abundance. 
In another ayah in the Quran, at the end of Surah Al-Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِيْتُمْ حَلِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ There has come unto you a messenger from amongst yourselves. It grieves him that you should perish. Deeply concerned is he about you. And the ulama say this part of the ayah is, is general. That the Prophet ﷺ has concern for the whole of humanity. And now we have a tafsis, now we have specificity. Rahim. To the believers he is kind and merciful. One of my favorite examples of this type of deep concerning and love that the Prophet ﷺ has for humanity, khususan with the Muslimin, is a hadith in Sahih Muslim when a man comes to the Prophet ﷺ in the month of Ramadan and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I broke my fast intentionally. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ said to him, you have to fast 60 consecutive days now. And the man said, I can't even fast Ramadan. How am I going to fast 60 consecutive days? So the Prophet ﷺ told him, free a slave. And he said, I can't afford to do that. He said, feed 60 poor people. And he said, with what? I have nothing. The Prophet ﷺ himself goes out and gives him some food. He says, here, take this and feed people. He said, feed who? He said, al-fuqara, the poor people. He said, Wallahi, I swear to Allah, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of God, there is no people more poor, more impoverished between the two mountains of Medina than my own family. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, take it and feed your family with it. He wanted Muslims to flourish. He avoided what Dr. Jackson calls gotcha Islam. You know, people that are trying to expose the faults of others. He yeah, gotcha. Right? No, the Prophet ﷺ wanted people to flourish. Think about the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when a man came to him after Salat al Asr. And he said to the Prophet ﷺ, I broke the commandment of Allah to punish me according to the kitab of Allah. Punish me according to the kitab of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, Hal hadarta ma'ana salah? Didn't you just pray with us? And the man said, Naam. He said, Yes. He said, Qad It's already been forgiven for you. It's already been forgiven. He wasn't seeking to, you know, mete out punishment against the Muslimin. The Prophet ﷺ was rahmatin lil alameen. There's a hadith, and there's some weakness in this hadith of the ulama quoted. The Prophet ﷺ said about the month of Ramadan, he said, Awwalahu rahmah. The beginning of the month is Rahmah. The ulama say the first 10 days and nights is Rahmah because the asas, the uh, foundation of everything, of anything, is Rahmah. The first ayah of the Quran is Bismillah, ar rahman ar rahim in the name of Allah, the infinitely, the, the indiscriminately compassionate, the intimately loving. The first hadith that children were taught, hadith of Rahmah, ar rahimun yarhamuhum ar rahman irhamu man fil ard, yarhamuhum man fil sama. Life in the dunya begins in the raham, in the womb of a mother. This word raham is related to rahmah. Beginning of the month is rahmah. Wa'awsatuhu ma'amthira. In the middle of the month is forgiveness. Because now we fasted for 10 days. And we've engaged in extra worship. We have, as it were, a sin offering to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an attempt to have him forgive us. Abu Huraira said, يُغْفَرُ فِي رَمَضَانِ إِلَّا مَنْ يَعْبَى Everyone is forgiven in Ramadan except the one who refuses. So they said to him, who refuses to be forgiven? And he said, the one who refuses to make istifa. That there are people who refuse to make istifa. People who believe in God. Our president was asked during the campaign, have you ever asked God for forgiveness? He said, I never had the need to ask for forgiveness. And there's actually a difference of opinion Amongst the ulama, who is better? The one who sinned and made tawbah, or the one who never sinned at all? Ultimately, they said the latter is better because he's closer to the rank of the prophets. But there's a genuine difference of opinion between the two. The Prophet said in Hadith al Tabadi that all of the sons of Adam, all of the children of Adam, with the exception of the prophets who are, uh, have isma, they're guarded from uh, intentionally, consciously disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> But everybody else is in a state of sin. But the best of those who sin are those who make tawbah, those who reorient themselves, literally turn back 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is at tawwab the one who reorients himself towards us. The Prophet <coughs> is Khayr al Khalqillah, he is the best of creation. He is ma'asum. He cannot consciously disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet he says, I seek Allah's forgiveness 70 times in the day. And our mother Aisha heard him in sajda. Heard him say, Subhanaka la ursi thana'an alayh. Anda kama anta kama athadayta ala nafsi. She heard him say, Glory be to you. I am incapable of praising you. The likes of which you have praised yourself. This is why he's making tawbah. Sallallahu alayhi alayhi wa sallam. Because he cannot praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised himself. And he's also our exemplar. He's teaching us how to have adab with our Lord. He said, Tuba liman wajada fi sahifatihi istighfaran kathira. Glad tidings to the one who finds a lot of istighfar uh, in his scroll on the Yom al Qiyamah. In the hadith of Ibn Hibban, the Prophet وسلم, ascended the minbar one Friday. He, he climbed the first step, he paused, and he said, Amin. And this was heard by the Sahaba in the front row. And then he climbed the second step, and he, and he paused, and he said, Amin. And this was heard by the Sahaba. And he climbed the third step, Amin. So after the prayer, they asked him, what was the meaning of this? Why did you say, Amin? And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Jibreel Alayhi Salam came to me while I was on the first step. And he said, Man adraka shahra Ramadan. The one who meets Ramadan and is not forgiven, he will enter the hellfire and will be distanced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَقُلْ آمين. فَقُلْ آمين. So he said to me, say Amin. So I said Amin. And then he said, I climbed the second step and Jibir alayhi salam came to me. And he said, the one who has one or two parents in old age, but did not take care of them, did not show piety towards his parents. And because of that, he enters the fire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will distance him. Kul ameen, fakul tu ameen. So he said to me, say amen, ameen. So I said, ameen. And he said, when I climbed the third step, Jibreel alayhi salam said, man dhukibta indahu falam yusalli alayhi. That the one, when you are mentioned, he does not bother to send benedictions upon you. When he hears the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he doesn't send a salah ala nabi fa'mata, fa'dakhal al-na, fa'ab'adahu Allah. And he dies and he's distanced by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Qul amin fa'qul tu amin. With respect to the first amin, in other words, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala's forgiveness in Ramadan is everywhere. And if you did not attain it, then truly we don't deserve Jannah. We really have to work hard not to make tawbah in Ramadan. If we're not making tawbah in Ramadan, we have to check our Ramadan, check our fasting. And then he said, The last part of Ramadan, which is the time that we're in, <coughs> is freedom from the fire. And this word, it'un, right? I'ta'kun. This is a word used in the context of slavery. This word means manumission or emancipation. That the meaning here according to the ulama is that we've been enslaved by our shahwa, by our base desires to the naw. That in Ramadan we are essentially purchasing our freedom from the fire by attaining independence from our shahwa. We are purchasing our freedom, we are manumitting our soul from the fire by attaining independence from our shahwa. In a hadith in Muslim in Tabmidi, the Prophet وسلم, he said, Hujibat in Narubi Shahawat. Hellfire is veiled by desires. In other words, hellfire is disguised to look like your desires. Like wasting time, or sexual deviancy, or excessive sleep, excessive eating, excessive joking. This is exemplified by a hadith attributed to Isa alayhi salam. When the dunya personified itself and manifested itself to him in the form of an old haggard prostitute. She came to Isa alayhi salam and he looked at her and he said, how is it that you're able to dupe and destroy so many men? Look at you. And she said, I hide in the shadows. This is the dunya manifested as this old woman speaking to Isa alayhi salam. 
I hide in the shadows and wave men over to me. And when they come to me, I slaughter them. They came to fulfill their shahwa and they found death. وَحُجِمَتِ الْجَنَّةِ بِالْمَكَارِ He continues, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Paradise is veiled by detestables. In other words, paradise is veiled to look like things that detestable to our shahwa. The shahwa, the base self, doesn't want to be active. It doesn't want to uh, live life in i'tidab, in moderation. It doesn't want to fast. It doesn't want to pray. It doesn't want to study. The nafs doesn't want these things. But this is the road to Jannah. Imam Ghazali said, the four things that we should habituate are nafs, solitude, silence, hunger, and sleeplessness. According to Imam Ghazali, the two main sources of ma'asiyah, of sin, come from the button and the farj, the stomach and uh, the genitals. And he called these as shahwatain, the two base desires. Book 23 of the Ihya is called Kasr Shahwatain, the breaking of the two desires. In Ramadan, food, drink, and relations, marital relations during the daytime are haram. The purpose is to discipline and purify the lower self, the nafs. One of the meanings of, of Shatta Min Zarahu that we mentioned earlier, we said was uh, a figure of speech in, in Arabic meaning that the Prophet ﷺ would get ready for serious business. Some of the ulama say this is a euphemism, that he would implement a self-imposed state of celibacy during the last 10 nights of Ramadan to concentrate on his worship, even though it's halal to do that. This is a training program to become malakani, to become angelic. تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَرُوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرٍ the angels, they only do, they only do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders them to do. They don't have volition. They are in a complete state of ta'a, a complete state of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in our postmodern society, these shahwatain become fully endorsed sometimes. You have these movements now, body acceptance movement, incredibly mysterious, enigmatic a mystery to medical uh, professionals, that people are saying there's no relationship between body weight and health. They use this acronym HAYS, healthy at every size. No doctor endorses this. This is a way of just shifting blame. I don't need to change myself for my gluttony, it's society's fault. That's who needs to change. Or if 25% of internet searches deal with indecent material, 25%. Billions of times a day. And you not only now have homosexual, you have bisexual, you have metrosexual, pansexual. What on earth is a pansexual? These people are, you know, they they sanction their lust, they shahwatain. In the Quran, the nafs is tripartite. When we're talking about the nafs, we're talking about the lower self, the base self that needs to be transformed. The anima in Latin, right? The psyche in Greek, we're not talking about the ruh or the spiritus, which is the uh, imperishable soul, the pneuma. We're talking about the nafs, is tripartite. And these are mentioned in the Quran. And nafs al amana is su. This is the nafs, the lower self, that incites towards evil, untrained, undisciplined. We have to work on that. We begin training our souls. The nafs becomes nafs al lawama, the striving soul. <coughs> <coughs> the striving soul, the soul that is engaging and disciplining itself and transforming itself. And then you have nafsul mutma'inna, the tranquil soul, the soul that has actualized the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. None of you truly believe until his shahwa, until his hawa is in perfect accordance with what I have brought sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the names of Ramadan is Shahrul Jihad, the month of intense striving. And the Sahaba, they engaged uh, the Mushrikeen, Ghazwat, uh, Badr, and Fath Mecca in the month of Ramadan. This is the martial or military aspect of Jihad, which is obviously only declared by legitimate state authority, not by vigilantes. But there's another aspect of Jihad. And this is a hadith. Some people say this is not a hadith. 
This is a hadith recorded by Imam al bayhaqi The Isnan is marfur. It goes all the way back to the Prophet It is a Hassan hadith, a good hadith. That when they were re re returning from Ghazwat Batr, the Prophet وسلم, said, we are returning from Al-Jihad Al-Asghar, the military aspect of Jihad, to Al-Jihad Al-Akbar, to the greater Jihad. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, we've just overcome three to one odds on the battlefield. What is this greater Jihad? And he said, Jihad Al-Nafs. Al-Mujahidu Man Jihad Al-Nafsa Fi Ta'atillah. This Hadith Musnad Ahmad. The quintessential Mujahid is the one who strives against his lower self, his base motives in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The question I get a lot, especially from the youth, is what is the point of fasting? Is it like a diet plan or something like that? Right. Which is interesting because the data shows that in many Muslim-majority countries, food consumption increases because we have Muslims gorging themselves, overeating, feasting, not fasting. This is incredible. This is a fitna. The Prophet he said, Kam min sa'imin. When he says come, it's either interrogative or rhetorical. Min sa'imin, a prepositional phrase, means it's ta'ajubiyah, it's rhetorical. Kam min sa'imin. Laysa lahu min siyamihi illa dhamam. How many people are there that fast, that get nothing from their fast except hunger? There is an axiom amongst the ulama that the merit of a thing is known by its objective. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayuha ladina amanu kutiba alikum usiyam kama kutiba ala ladina qablikum. That, O oh, you who believe fasting has been prescribed upon you just as it was prescribed upon those before you. Of course, you have some Christians that will fast Lent, you have Jews that fast uh, Yom Kippur and other days. And then he says, La'allakum tattaqun. In order for you to have taqwa. Right? This is the objective. In order for you to have taqwa. The word taqwa is related to wiqaya, which is a shield. The Prophet said in a hadith of Bukhari, Asomu Jumna. The fast is a shield that you're guarding yourself from what are known as the seven inroads to the heart. And this is something we're supposed to be doing all throughout the year. But the human being, insan, forgets. Probably the etymology of the word insan is nesia, the one who's always forgetting. We need reminders. We need an annual training program. This is the purpose of Ramadan. That we have a shield to protect the inroads to the heart. The seven inroads, al-ayn, the eye. That when we're fasting, we see something haram. We suddenly remember we're fasting. We distract, we, we look away. We divert our glances. The ear, udun, we don't hear something haram. The lisan, we don't talk ill of people. We guard our tongues. The yad, the hand, we're not stealing things. We're not abusing people. The qadam, the foot, we're not going to somewhere that's impermissible. And then the button and the thumbs, and the last two are especially harmful, according to Imam al-Ghazak. Abu Yazid al-Bistani, he said, hunger, is a cloud. Whenever a bondsman is hungry, his heart rains down wisdom. Very different than what we're hearing from the postmodern priests. Now, if you look at the Quran, we have a section in Al Baqarah, 2183 to 187, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking of fasting. Now, nestled within these ayat about Ramadan, Fasting is prescribed. Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed. If you're sick, if you're traveling, so on and so forth. Right in the middle of these ayat, of these ayat, we have this seemingly unrelated ayat. Right in the middle, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa ida saalaka ibadi anni fa inni qabil, ujibu da'wa tada'i ida da'an." These ayat are not unrelated. You see, every surah of the Quran. The ayat exhibit a coherent structure according to the rules of Semitic rhetoric. There's an incredible book, Nidham al Quran, Hamiduddin al Farahi, and his student, Amin Ahsan al Islahi, who wrote an incredible tafsir of the Quran in Urdu called the Tempur al Quran, nine volumes. It's in the process of being translated. This is incredible work. Western scholastics recognize this. Probably the best work written in English or translated into English on this topic of the coherent structure of the Quran was by a Belgian priest, Jesuit priest, Michel Kuypers, 
called the composition of the Quran, rhetorical analysis. So the question is, what did this ayah have to do with fasting? When my servants ask you concerning me, say I am qareeb, I am close to them. I answer uh, every supplicant when he calls upon me. The ulama say the relationship of this ayah with this section, with this cluster of ayat, is that siyam, that fasting, is the path to actualize qurb. Is the path to actualizing nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when we fast, we begin to experience Allah's nearness. I'll give you a quick example. Fasting causes us, or at least it should cause us, to empathize with those who are hungry. The Prophet وسلم, said on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask a group of people, You were in the world and you never fed me. <coughs> you were in the world and you never fed me. And they will say, You are Rabbul Alameen, how can we feed you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, If you had fed the hungry, you would have found me with them. Siyam is the path to actualize Quran. I answer every supplicant. I answer every supplicant when he calls upon me. Part and parcel to fasting is dua, that we should be in a state of dua. And the most exalted of the dua during this time, according to our mother Aisha, she said the Prophet would constantly recite this dua. Allahumma inna ta'afoon. We have to memorize this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-afu, which is different than al ghafir Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many names indicating his attribute of forgiveness. He is al-tawab, as we mentioned, al ghafir right? Then you have these intensive forms, al ghafur al ghafar right? Which basically means the one who veils the sin. The sin is still there, but Allah will veil it. But al-afu, the one who is al-afu, is the one who obliterates every trace of the sin. It's erased completely. And we forget about it. We don't see it later on the Yom Al-Qiyamah. And of course, any one of these nights is later to the public. Ibn Abbas, he said, that the Prophet Wasallam said, il tamisuha al ashra awakh that seek this night and the last ten nights of the month of Ramadan. This is when the Quran was revealed. Inna anzalna mufilayat al Allah subhanahu wa taala sent down the Quran. This is called the Inzal. The Inzal of the Quran is when the Quran came down in one shot and one dufa and laid it al Qadr from the lower, from the tablet to the firmament to the Salat al Dunya. It's called the Inzal. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over the next 23 years revealed the Quran piecemeal from the firmament to the sacred heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is called the Tanzil. As the Quran says that this night is better than a thousand months. Better than a thousand months. A lifetime of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to be able to uh, to fasten our seatbelts, to roll up our sleeves and get down to serious business and give us tawfiq to catch this later to the and have the reward of over a thousand months of Ulu Qawli Hada wa astaghfirullah wa rakum fa astaghfiru in the Mubu al